Does anyone want to actually Hello. look at the site and see? <laughs> we're, yes. we're live, lad. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Welcome to the Verge Mobile Show, where we talk about mobile technology, mobile industry, and uh, the colors of smartphones. This is episode 25 for the week of November 12th, and I am Dieter Bone. I'm Dan I'm Seifert. Glad Savo. Oh my god. <laughs> and I'm perfectly in sync with Dan Seifert. Yeah, and we're a little bit of a train wreck. <laughs> yeah, I've disrupted everything. I'm leaving. I'm gone. You are, yeah. You, we're having some uh, awesome pixelation on your video, but that's okay. Oh, um, dude, I'm, I'm just looking at it now. It's kind of going up and down. It's like uh, I'm the anonymous member of the podcast. Yeah, I can't read your lower third right now, but uh, we know who you are and where you are. Yeah, I'm the anonymized for his own safety. Uh, yeah, I, I'm the representative internet troll in today's podcast, uh, taking the place of Chris Ziegler, our usually nominated troll. Yeah. Who's an absentee today in protest. So yes. the, um, the most important mobile news of the week is that uh, in Skyfall, James Bond thankfully only used his Sony Xperia TL phone for like four seconds. Great. Yeah. Spoiler alert. I mean, come on, man. I haven't seen it yet. What? Oh, we. Oh, man. There's so much I want to talk about with this movie. Uh, I purposely did not read your your forum post on it because. uh, Yeah, there is a very long rant that I posted in the forums um, about uh, about the movie, and I recommend you go read it. Uh, I think it's it's the Xperia TX or the Xperia TX. Is that what it is? I got that wrong. No, I think I, you guys have the TL in the United States. It's yeah, the TL nice. is the AT and T model. Right. So there's three different names which are almost identical for a phone that is pretty much identical. Yeah. For the differences. Anyway, uh, it's, it's terrible. I don't want to talk about it. It's identically identically uh, <laughs> dis- disappointing. So. Yeah, but that, that's the perfect way to put it. Um, but actually, uh, on the topic of the biggest news, I was looking at our topics list. And I was taking. Yeah, and you were trolling me hard on me uh, with this. Like I just, I, you know, I put it together in an order that made a little bit of sense. But it's not. I'm not like making a huge judgment call here. We can start wherever you want, Vlad. You want to start talking about BBM? We can start talking about BBM. Oh yeah, t- uh, dude, revolution. <laughs> <laughs> well, it actually is kind of a thing. Uh, well, uh, I mean, I feel like uh, I should not be the one ranting about this because I feel like uh, Dieter, uh, sh- you should rant about this. But but what the heck, man? BlackBerry what? Messenger, this it, it's for BlackBerry Seven. Yeah, they they have to. Oh, so if you don't know what we're talking about, is uh, Rim has announced that there's a new version of BlackBerry Messenger that will offer free voice calls over Wi-Fi. Um, doesn't look like there needs to be any carry involvement because it's over Wi-Fi. Um, and, you know, it's it's an interesting and useful feature. Um, and they're making it available on BlackBerry 7 devices, earlier devices not so much, and they haven't said anything, I don't think, about BlackBerry 10. I mean, if it's not on there, that's ridiculous. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> so uh, maybe I, I shouldn't share this, but I'm going to. We... Uh, we're like, okay, well, we should test this thing out. Who <laughs> on the Verge staff has a BlackBerry that we can, you know, we need at least two people with Blackberries on the Verge staff, you know, with active BBM accounts and like, you know, active data to uh, to test this. And it was like crickets. I, appar- apparently, person. the the minimum of two people was was two more than we actually have to <laughs> at our disposal. <laughs> um, the other thing is, Rim announced that they're going to launch. BlackBerry, they're going to have a launch event for BlackBerry 10 on January 30th, and presumably uh, they'll actually be releasing it in different areas of the world shortly thereafter, although they won't say what. I just hope it's not another one of these, we're launching and it doesn't mean anything, kind of events like we've seen with Windows Phone so often. Um, Which but, it pretty much is guaranteed to be. Uh, we'll see. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm the, 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 one, not the one thing I don't expect to see is January 30th comes... Torsten Heinz takes the stage and he's like, here's a BlackBerry 10 device, all touch. Here's our BlackBerry 10 device, um, physical keyboard. He'll show both of them. That's fine. Yeah. But he's not going to say, pre-order today, shipping next week. He's not going to do the Apple way of launching a product, which is the thing he should be doing. Yeah. But anyway, seriously, 
Now that I've counter I trolled I myself. You wanted, you wanted I think I trolled myself by calling BBM a revolution. Uh, because the thing that I was saying isn't the biggest news story, which a lot of people might consider it to be the biggest news story. Is Apple and HTC settling their patent disputes? But I am sick and tired of all this legal stuff. We'll come to it. I mean, it's significant, it's important, but it's not the most fascinating news. It's not the thing that everybody's been talking about. The thing that everybody has been talking about is the Nexus 4 going on sale. Yes, and what a is, mess that is. Oh my, what a mess that was. I mean, I, I wasn't all that fascinated by it. I wasn't one of those guys who was chomping at the bit to buy one, but it was such a fascinating experience for me to witness the guys who were. Uh, specifically, one of them is on today's podcast. Uh, Mr. Seaford and yeah, yeah. So uh, let let me let me tell you about my my position with the Nexus Four. So I was really eager uh, to see it go on sale, and I was thinking maybe I'll buy one, maybe I won't. But I hadn't really committed to it. Uh, and then you know when at uh, noon uh, yesterday when it went on sale in the U.S. and the whole Play Store went down, I was actually tied up at an event, so I had like no way that I could really realistically try to purchase this thing. Uh, and of course, the, the store goes down, and people aren't able to purchase, and uh, supposedly it sells out so quickly. So uh, you know, I'm back in our office a couple hours later, and you know, people in our office are saying, "Well, we're just able to refresh the store page like 40 times in a row, and suddenly I'm able to buy it." So I, I see two of our other uh, staffers buy them successfully, and then I pretty much made it a rule that if I'm able to make it show up in the Play Store, I pretty much have to buy it. So, so I refreshed the Play Store like 50, 60 times in a row until uh, I got the Add to Cart button, and I, I quickly added to cart and submitted my purchase, and now I'm you know $400 poorer. Uh, so basically, <laughs> their strategy, we, we, you know, I, was, I was all set to go on a rant about how ridiculous is it that Google can't just get a simple Play Store uh, up and running that says out of stock, you know, order and we'll let you know when stock comes in. Like you, that's like, you know, that's insane that you, they just don't let you buy it if, you know, you just need to sit there and refresh it. But maybe they're secretly geniuses and uh, they're just, they, you wouldn't have bought it if it was just there. But since, you know, it's like gambling, you just got to keep trying. It's like, the, exactly. Uh, the, I mean, that totally worked for me because if it was just like I signed on, it's like, oh, there it is. It's for sale. Should I buy it? Uh, maybe I wouldn't buy it. But because it was like, you know, Maybe Jackpot. I can get this. Oh yeah, I won! Congratulations, <laughs> you just lost four hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, woo! But this this was the fascinating aspect to me because it was kind of a psychological behavioral experiment. It's like we've got this thing, we've got it priced at a level where people are really going to be eager to buy it anyway, and then we'll just introduce scarcity into the equation, like mm -hmm. severe and random scarcity. That's the other thing. Exactly as Dan says, it's a jackpot. It's like, yes, I got into this, and now I'm pressured. I mean, I don't know. It's it's like a really well executed uh, strategy that you might get from an estate agent. Like, dude, we've got people coming in next, so either you pony up all your money right now, or it's gone. You have to deal with it, uh, which, oh, which is interesting. But also, uh, I mean, the thing to say is Dan was saying the Play Store was crashing and coming down. Uh, lunchtime in the US. The Play Store was up and down all over the world since the middle of the night, since Australia. Uh, and the jokes on Twitter were like, it's called a Nexus 4 because they made four units per continent. And, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Obviously, there, was, there were limited quantities, um, fewer than, uh, well, I guess Google and LG just underestimated how much demand there will be for this phone. Um, I don't know, w w were there any actual like server issues preventing people just getting their orders through, or was it... A uh, there there was a bunch of weirdness. I think people, especially in the UK, I heard that like people would have it in their cart, and then they'd go to like check out, and it would disappear from their cart. So there was definitely some some odd things happening there, um, uh, you know, aside from the whole, you know, hammering the refresh thing that we had going on over here. And I, I'm just going to recite one more joke that I picked up on Twitter. I'm, I'm a complete uh, uh, plagiarist today, but somebody will say, you know, this would be totally embarrassing if Google actually ran cloud services. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> I, I think I saw that, yeah. It's a shame it's not a giant company that runs uh, massive cloud internet services. <laughs> right, because then it would be totally embarrassing what's happening right now. <laughs> so, so it was a bit of a shambles, but you know, the Nexus 4 is out now, the Nexus 10 is out now. Uh, well, you, know, actually, you know what in. it is? They, they're running their Google Play servers to sell the device off of an HSPA network instead that, of an LTE. Network. That must be it. That's the, <laughs> yeah, that's and, the and it's 4G, here. man. So, uh, to, you know, to, to follow up yesterday's insanity with the online orders, uh, today, uh, here in the U.S., T-Mobile stores in select locations and small quantities started selling the device in store. Uh, and, and how do and, we know that, Dan? Well, we know this, uh, well, A, because T-Mobile said it would happen, but we know <laughs> that it was a, for a fact that it, they were there because a certain Mr. Chris Ziegler, who decided not to be on uh, the show today, uh, went over to a store and, and laid down some serious cash uh, for an Nexus 4, uh, despite uh, the fact that uh, he, he's, he's hated on it pretty much ever since it's, it's been announced. I'm not he said he was going to break my kneecaps if, uh, <laughs> if I brought this up during the show, so... Uh, I'll be prepared to prepare to be uh, in a cast next week. <laughs> I mean, I'm look, strong. like I was saying, the psychology of what Dan did makes perfect sense to me. The psychology of what Chris did, <laughs> no idea. I I can't even was begin it, to explain that. Was the so, Nexus Four in Cyan? Is that what the the story was? Well, you know, I I knew this was going to happen with Chris because the exact same thing happened with the iPhone Five, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He literally was like not going to buy one, and then at four forty five in the afternoon, the day it was, he was like, "Guys, I'm going to walk over to the AT&T store," and he walked over to the AT&T store and bought one and came back with one. So and then I mean, he bought I'm a, not shocked uh, at the least bit. And then he bought a Lumia nine twenty. Yeah, yeah, and he's using a Lumia nine twenty now that he just bought. So. <laughs> Oh, can can I just digress on the iPhone five for a minute, like a quick minute? Sure. Thank you. I don't think we're really going to stop you, so. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> th thanks for the permission. I appreciate it. Uh, I just want to say I've been, I've been using the iPhone five for about a week, uh, not because I actually prefer it or want to. Um, I'm being forced to for completely professional reasons. You understand, um, but I, I'm on board. I, I, I like this phone and. The, the other thing is, I haven't used iOS, I've used it on the iPad for a while, but I haven't used it on the phone for a while. And it's so kind of cozy and comforting to know that every single thing in my life has an app. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking my supermarket has an app, yeah. my supermarket's loyalty scheme has an app, EasyJet has an app, uh, that's kind of okay. British Airways has an app, it kind of sucks. Uh, but it's like every single thing that I can think of. Dictionary.com has an app, and and they're not all great. They're not all perfect. Is the uh, is the broccoli app any good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about the dude? Uh, I got I gotta tell you the deficit of like raw vegetable search engines. <laughs> I, I got to know, uh, Vlad. Is there like a social network app that where you share your raw carrots uh, with other uh, fans of raw carrots? No, do, do you see my relationship with carrots? I think has been way over. I'm sure that's called grinder. Um, Car carrot gram. <laughs> uh, seriously, carrots have quite a bit of sugar in them, so so I'm I'm, I'm <laughs> controlling my intake of carrots. Okay, all right. I just want that on the record that Vlad <laughs> is controlling his intake of carrots, not because you have to, man. Them or because of the taste, but because there's a little too much sugar in carrots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I have to, like, uh, like for example, yesterday I, I ate a pomegranate. That's really sugary, but it's amazing. So it's like my um, sugar intake. And this digression really is not comfortable for me. So we just move right along. All I'm saying is with the iPhone, um, like, the distinction to me is a qualitative one where Android has a really fully fleshed out ecosystem and it feels robust, right? You, you get apps for pretty much everything you need. But with Apple, there's this extra step with iOS where you just know it's going to happen. And, and the other thing is um, Skype just this week got updated to support the iPhone 5 and uh, we're kind of like, whoa, it's about time. Uh, <laughs> you know, and the iPhone 5 just came out. And, yeah. and, and it's like, this is the pace at which change gets, uh, or, or rather developers work to adapt to change in the Apple ecosystem. It's just so rapid. So it's like iPhone 5 comes out, it's a new size, new resolution, but you know that within a month or two, everybody just knows how important that app is to them and they update they do they do that 
And that's just a really comforting and reassuring thing for consumers. And and this is part of the reason why we keep harping on about this ecosystem uh, action with Windows Phone. You know, I, I I'm starting to hate the word ecosystem now because it, it's starting to lose its meaning. But this is this is what it means to me, and I wanted to share that with you guys. And now we can talk about the Droid DNA. Oh, you want to talk about the Droid DNA? I, yeah, let's. I mean, we could talk about Windows. No, let's talk about the Droid DNA. So no, we, we should. We should. Uh, Droid DNA, Dan, you have held it in. Oh, oh my god! god. <laughs> can, can, can you get an actual picture on there? Like an image instead of uh, Sense uh, Four, so, because Sense Four. No, is I, th I think Sense Four is what you want. Uh, you're putting me on the Sense Four is never what I want, Dan. Uh, I don't even know. Is, I, I don't even know if I get the thing in the camera. camera. Why are you looking down? Because I'm trying. I'm trying to. Uh, <laughs> here, let me do one of these. Uh, it's like I've never used one before. Yeah, it's like... All I have are screenshots on here, so uh, it's actually pretty lame. Um, but let's do... Wait, if you're listening to the things. audio version of the podcast, so, you, uh, you're uh, missing... Yeah, here's, here's, here's the Droid DNA. Um, it's really thin uh, for, for what it's size, but obviously the, the, the star of the show is the five inch 1080p display. Uh, and it's, it's like 440 PPI. Um, I don't know if this will actually focus that close, but you really, uh, nice. you can't see the pixels. Uh, there's just, there's no pixels and the viewing angles are insane. It's uh, super oh LCD three. It looks like the image is literally like floating on the surface there. Dude, it's, that is nice. I mean, uh, we've been we've been raving all year about the One X display uh, and its Super LCD 2 with 720p and how it's the best mobile display that we've ever seen. And even though newer stuff has come out, like the iPhone 5 and the Galaxy S3, uh, the One X is still the best. Uh, but uh, this is better. Um, so so there's you know there's that. The other thing is you know it's five inches. It's pretty big. Uh, as you can see, but it's not as big as you might expect from a 5-inch phone. I compared it side-by-side -side with a One X yesterday, and uh, it's a little bit taller than the One X, but it's it's about the same width. Really? And, yeah, it's about the same, because it's, it's, I don't know, it's just so tall and narrow. Uh, the How bezel's is the really battery, Dan? The battery is 2,020 milliamp hours, so it's actually kind of small. Uh, yeah. Well, it's insane. It's insane to say that a two thousand milliamp hour battery is small these days, but uh, it, it that's the fact. It's, it's but yeah, for, for the screen size and the high resolution. Um, yeah, yeah, I've got I've got to do some more tests on it. Um, but I, I'm battery is my concern. It's super thin though. You can see it's got like these tapered edges to make it. And let's also heavy. mention, and this this is I think is a big credit for it for HTC is that they've built the wireless charging right into the phone while it's that thin. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's uh you because you can't access the battery. Of course, uh, the battery door does not come off, so you can't access that. So, it is nice. But I will. Uh, I'm gonna hate on this right now. Um, if you see this, uh, on the bottom is where the micro USB port is, and look what I have to do to access it. Uh, oh. because it's a door. I can't recall the last phone I I I, I tested that had a, a door on the battery. Uh, or That's the really USB. terrible. And so, and it's actually really hard to get out. And it's really hard to put back in as far as inconvenience. So well, that's, uh, that's, that's why you have wireless charging and wireless syncing, right? Yeah, I, I guess that's that's what they're trying to push. Uh, the other thing that I'm super annoyed about is the placement of the power button, which is at the top in the middle, which is right. like the worst place to put on a five-inch device. Well, we discussed this last week. You just need to bang it out, you know, on your forehead, <laughs> your beer can. Uh, the the other thing that's really cool, I'm like totally giving away all of the uh, the stuff that's going to be in my review in a couple of days. But if you see this flashing, it's got yeah, a notification light cool. on the back of the phone. Oh, that is awesome! So it, there's is one on the front. You can see it flash. There it yeah. goes. And then on the back, right there. Like like that's that's one of the coolest things I've seen. So that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So it's kind of, it's, I mean, it's, how would you how would you characterize the the build quality? I mean, I've got a Note two back here, and I I still feel like it's typical Samsung. Like it's good and fine, but it has that vague feeling of being plasticky. Well, this this doesn't feel too plasticky. It's all soft touch on the back. The back is 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 really slate and and and, and flat, but it's all soft touch materials. Uh, it's got this kind of funky. Uh, I don't know if you can see it there. Uh, grill on the side. Yeah. Um, that's on both sides, and you know it's it's pretty typical HTC build quality. It's not a unibody though, like uh, the One X. So it's it's not a, doesn't feel like a unibody, but okay. I mean, it's all. It's actually really light too. It's 138 grams, which for a phone of this size is is lighter than I would expect. It's lighter I mean, than it's the iPhone. Lighter than the yeah. <laughs> Dude, you beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's like so. So uh, if for those of you who don't know, the nine twenty is really heavy. But I'm sure if you're listening to this, you do know that. But around uh, the verge, we've begun to call that the tank. So yeah. uh, we just refer to like you know, oh, I'm checking out the tank, or I'm holding the tank, or I'm using the tank today. So to, to be fun. fair, the Lumia A twenty isn't that much lighter. I think it's 160 grams. So That's both insane. of them are really nice, hefty phones. And and this is why I'm saying credit to HTC because they're building wireless charging right into this device, which is very thin, and the Windows Phone 8X, which again is very thin and even smaller. It's a 4.3 inch phone. Uh, so, you know, Nokia's excuse that we've packed the most advanced yada yada into this phone, therefore we made it the size and weight of a tank, uh, it is a bit flaky uh, when, when you compare it to what HTC is achieving. I can't find, there's an infographic that's floating around about the weight of the 920, <laughs> and uh, I can't find it, but, the, you know, they, they quote me, they quote, you know, it's a tank, and they quote, like, wired somebody else, and then they have, like, oh, you're just being a baby, here's why it's okay, and then, like, the first, like, comparison is an iPhone 5 and, like, two slices of bologna, and, like, that equals the weight of yeah, the it's... 20, so fuck up. Yeah, it was two slices of turkey. Two slices of turkey. <laughs> In the iPhone 5. Well, there's got to be some pretty thick slices of turkey, if you ask me. Yeah, no, that's what I said. But um, So this thing is running a Tegra processor, right? No. No, no this is no. a Qualcomm Snapdragon S4 Pro. So oh, it's, it's a S4 Pro. Don't okay, so spoil still... any more of the... Okay, yeah, okay. We're just talking about specs. We know the but specs. We, yeah, I, I mean, that... I'm just saying what is, it is. That spec is very nice and sexy and attractive to me because... We, we all know the Snapdragon S4 is eminently more efficient than the Tegra option. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't well, we need don't, that. We, uh, we, we think the S4... No, the, we know. We know. The S4, it, well, this is the S4 Pro. It's a quad core. Yeah, and... I know. But, but at the same time, it doesn't come with a gimmicky companion core. Uh, right. it, it actually can crank itself down. It, do, it doesn't have a little buddy coming along for the ride. Well, right, LG exactly. on their Optimus G put like an eco mode thing, and I got an email asking me to you know talk about how eco mode affects battery life, and I don't know not much. Like they've got a whole bunch of widgets for messing around with the processor, which made me worried that maybe it wouldn't be that battery friendly. But uh, I don't have the, the Optimus Gs on me anymore. But in my time with them, you know, I found the processor to be super fast and uh, didn't seem like it was problematic on battery life. That, uh, that's but, a... I mean, this thing has got a huge screen, so who knows. It's a screen, and it's the high resolution. It's pushing around a lot bigger, resol- more yeah. pixels. Uh, we know that, like with when the iPad three was in, uh, revealed, uh, that had a really high res screen, and Apple added like almost double the battery over the iPad two to get the same battery life. Um, so, uh, you know, th- that could make a difference. I obviously am not gonna, don't know just yet because I still got to run a few tests on it. But uh, right, uh, that but could it, make it. If I can bring it back to the Optimus G. Uh, that's a great point. The data raises. Uh, I also have zero idea what that eco mode does on that phone, but I enabled it. And it actually had endurance, which was like, it, it was significant enough for me to notice that, that it's longer than most phones uh, in, in that size class. Uh, and it was with that battery. And I was like, why is this happening? What's so special about it? And now that you mentioned the eco mode uh, and the Core Core S4, that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, which all in all actually makes the Droid DNA a really, you know, compelling option uh, for a lo- whole heap of people, apart from the whole sense situation. And, and let me quickly mention the price in the U.S. of one ninety nine, uh, yeah. and it should be launching this time. Right, pre-orders are available now, but it should be launching this time next week, eleven twenty first. Um, it's kind of amazing. It's it's really impressive. All of us thought it would be like higher than that, didn't we? Uh, I would have expected it, yeah. For the first 1080p phone in the U.S. to be priced yeah. at 199 is pretty significant. If we go back a year, uh, HTC was the first company in the U.S. to bring a 720p phone. Uh, with, with the Resound. The Resound. Yeah. And that was priced at 299 So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's offering a lot, of, a lot of specs for the price. That's definitely uh, for sure. And we How just all accepted that phones can be this big, and that's okay. Like it, we're we're not complaining about phablets. We're not complaining about oh god, the screen is so big. I hate this. Is why why are they forcing these huge phones on us? We're just sort of yeah. That's how big phones are now. That's how it goes. Uh, no, I mean, I geez, guess. Then, then we then people are just going to be like, am I watching a rerun of episode twelve <laughs> or episode twenty four <laughs> or episode twenty seven? We're echoing ourselves like. You register your complaint once. Uh, we already know no, we have. When you register your complaint, nobody listens, and then you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you carry on. 
<laughs> hey, dude, we already know we have HTC in our audience, right? So I'm sure, I'm sure they're slaving away on that on that 4.1 inch super phone that yeah. all of us want Jeez. with a 720p the... screen or whatever it is, 300 DPI for whatever resolution that is. Uh, yeah, seriously, pixel density isn't that important anymore. Like, I I, I still want to see and experience that 1080p phone naturally, obviously. Uh, but you know, once you get past like 340 DPI, you know the 720p resolution of 4.3 inch screen, uh, then it just gets silly. Like, yeah, I mean, you you didn't need to say that you can't see the pixels on this thing, Dad. I, I know it's basically like <laughs> lit up paper. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, because it's a that super LCD, like you could see the the viewing angles are really great too. So, yeah. Well, looking forward to the review, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And then you send it over my work. way. Because <laughs> yeah. where, where it won't work. <laughs> doesn't matter, man. No, it will work. I, oh, I don't need it to be a phone. What, yeah. what is this outdated idea of using a phone as an actual phone? Like, if, if I needed that, I would get BBM with those awesome voice calls, man. <laughs> and then I would, like, plug it into the Nexus 7 with 3G data. Ha. Huh. Oh, yes. Uh, actually, we reviewed the Nexus 7 with 3G data uh, yeah. just this week. We don't normally talk about tablets here, but... And I, uh, I ordered the iPad mini with uh, LTE. should be arriving on Friday. <laughs> Are you seriously doing what you're doing right now, Dieter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is really compelling for uh... <laughs> Uh, audio audio. Oh, <laughs> well, you can probably hear him jumping up and down. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not excited about going back from Retina, but I mean, whatever. I'm excited to have a tablet with LTE in it because uh, the Net my Nexus 7 doesn't. Um, I, yeah, I, that I, I, I definitely agree with you there, uh, Dieter. Like, I, I, I like my Nexus 7 at home, but it rarely leaves the house with me just because it's a pain to get connected. Yeah. So. Uh, should we talk about Jelly Bean? It's, uh, it's rolled out to... There was, like, the downloads you could get, and I'm pretty sure they're rolling out an OTA slowly to uh, some devices, Galaxy Nexus, Nexus 7. Uh, yeah, I got Nexus, my OTA today, actually. Oh, did you get your OTA? For my Nexus Congratulations. Uh, Nexus S and Moto Zoom not getting it. So this is kind of insane, uh, if you ask me. Because both of those devices are on 4.1, actually 4.1.2 now. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I don't know uh, the reason why they wouldn't be updated to 4.2. Yeah, I don't either. It's it's actually kind of aggravating. Um, maybe, I don't know. Like Maybe yeah. those lock screen widgets just take up so much resources. Well, or if, if it's like, if it's a space issue, maybe. But then, you know, lighten your OS up, Google. Trim some fat. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's a space issue. I mean, the thing that, that's funny is because when you go from 4.0 to 4.1, uh, there's a much more of a jump, I think, than 4.1 to 4.2. There's there's much more of a performance increase. There's a lot of under the hood stuff that happened. Um, so I could almost see some them saying this isn't getting four point going from 4.0 to 4.1, but from 4.1 right. to 4.2 is a little bit more of a, a disappointment. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I actually really like the new uh, clock on the lock screen. Yeah, uh, it's, it's just cool. really clean and clear and readable. Uh, not not that the stock Google lock screens have ever been particularly terrible, but like the new one is really nice. It's like in four point two, and it will be available in zero point five percent of Android devices. I'm sure. <laughs> We'll, we'll look at those Android stats uh, at the beginning of next month, and it'll be like that. This is this is a frustrating thing, the annoying thing, yeah. and um, the recurring thing. But if you have an older phone and you want to get uh, to a newer version of Android, Sanja Mod 10, uh, they've gone to a stable release. Uh, so it's not technically 4.2, but you know they're working to integrate 4.2 stuff into Sanja Mod 10. Um, this is what I'm running on my uh, HTC One X on AT and T. And uh, I endorse Cyanogemod. I think it's uh, really good and really awesome. I'm really happy with it. Um, apparently, there's some drama today. Like, the, it's the person who owns Cyanogemod.com is like not giving it back to them and was like being a jerk. And uh, so now they've moved over to Cyanogenmod.org instead. 
Yeah, they got. Yeah, I guess there's a little do- domain fight there. Um, yeah. Someone got a little bit uh, uh, tiffy. Whatever. I'm just I'm I'm pretty happy with uh, CM10 on the One X. This is the reason I'm not buying uh, a Nexus Four. Is uh, I can get uh, you know I can keep my LTE and have something relatively close to the stock experience. I like what Cyanogen Mod does on top of Android 4.1 instead of just offering a straight stock AOSP ROM. Um, and you know there's still some bugs. There's, you know whatever they're still working on it, but uh, you know it's really awesome, and I'm not going to buy a Nexus 4. Not going to do it. Wouldn't be prudent. Vlad, why do you have no interest in the Nexus 4, if I might ask? Because because the LTE thing, I think, is much less of an issue for you in the UK than it is for us here in the US. I, I just want to say, with respect to what Dieter is talking right now, it's like, I'm not going to think about the big pink elephant. I'm not going to think about the giant pink elephant. And then the only thing in his mind is like, man, there's a pink elephant in my imagination. Yeah, it's pretty uh, bad. Yeah. So, yeah, Dieter, I'm sure you're not going to buy a Nexus 4. I totally buy that. I'll Why just buy the I... Nexus 4 bumper. How about that? How, rid- <laughs> How ridiculous is it that they're selling a bumper? Dude, I seriously, I, I don't think I've got enough credit. I don't think enough people have written about my uh, foresight when I was bitching about the glass back. Like, as soon as the Nexus 4 was announced, I was first to jump on that bandwagon and say, this glass back is tr- trouble. Uh, well, then, because and then, the glass and then Josh breaks, damn it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, that's, that's just one of them. I mean, the future is laden with cracked glass backs on Nexus 4s and people cursing their luck and thinking, this could have been some sort of you know high-end plastic and I would have been happy and probably just kind of cringe at LG's random patterns and stylings and whatever. But, I mean, okay, let, let's answer Dan's question, why I'm not so psyched about Nexus 4. I think I also kind of addressed it when I was uh, enthusing about the Windows Phone 8X. And, I mean, this also kind of speaks to the fact that as mobile reviewers, we're not regular people. Uh, we're different. Uh, worse, in a lot of ways. I, I don't I don't know if I agree with you. I think Chris is uh, uh, the prototypical uh, mobile phone buyer, <laughs> and Chris is the perfect example. <laughs> okay, but, but then again, no, I'm just, I'm just I, I don't think I don't think that I am because yeah. like the fact of the matter is you run, you run for all these Android phones. You get to use them for a week, two weeks, a month, whatever, uh, and then you get kind of bored of, of the, with them, and then you move on, etc. Whereas most people have to make these choices for months and months. Um, at an end. I mean, if, again, if you're Chris Ziegler, <laughs> you don't because he fucking he freaking buys things on an impulse. He's like, he, he's like, you feel he feels a wind in his beard, and then you bought a new phone. It's it's like that. I, I don't even know what to say about it. Um, but okay, this this point is meandering. What what I'm really trying to say is, I've just grown bored of Android to some extent. Uh, I've, I've what I've really grown bored of is non-stock Android and basically Sense is my uh, nemesis at this point and it's the thing that drives me nuts because the Droid DNA would be so much more of a fascinating, captivating device to me if it was running 4.2 stock uh, which again, the Nexus 4 runs but I've also had time with the Optimus G which is essentially the Nexus 4 and, and it's like am I going to be thrilled and excited about the Optimus G with stock Android? To some extent, I mean, obviously I prefer it, but it's, it's, it's just some an experience that I've had already. And this is why I'm psyched to see Windows Phone develop and grow and do some more interesting things, because that is a chance to look at something that's truly new. Uh, this is why I had a digression about the iPhone 5, because I've been away from iOS for a while, which, again, marks me out as being particularly different, since everybody's freaking using that. Um, and it's probably why I'm going to be, you know, uh, fascinated by the new BlackBerry devices when they release in February 2014. <laughs> <laughs> you go, Wilson. We're rooting for you. Um, yeah, no, I, I see. I see your argument, uh, Vlad. And it's, it's. I, I, you know, uh, I've been. We've been teasing Chris today, but I kind of wish he was here to talk about 
uh, his his using the Lumia 920 because uh, he's call- yesterday I quote he called himself a uh, a Windows Phone 8 convert uh, because he's like you know perfectly happy with the with the, the Lumia 920 right now. Um, but yeah, I mean it's a different experience, I guess, and uh, uh, you know it's not the same old Android and, and iOS run of the mill type of thing that we've seen for a couple of years now. Yeah, but okay, let, let's actually get to the topic that was on top of our topic list, which is Apple and HTC, because that was not the week, but the weekend's absolute mm-hmm. biggest news. Yeah, yeah. I, I well, was at, at, like, I was at to Sanofsky. Sanofsky is the biggest news. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. in our in our mobile world, uh, Apple and HTC are the biggest news. So, yeah. so in our for the mobile show, uh, Apple and HTC. So Saturday night, I'm at a wedding at, at uh, the uh, reception for this wedding, and my phone just starts blowing up because uh, Apple and HTC decide to announce that they've become. Uh, uh, reached a 10-year licensing agreement uh, and settled all of their patent litigation. Uh, around the world. Uh, yeah, around the world. And, like, uh, you know, and they had to, of course, announce it at, you know, whatever it was. Our, our post went up at 10 after 9, so they must have announced it just around 9 p.m. So it's... Uh, um, uh, thanks, <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs> but it, it's a it's a pretty monumental thing. It's one of the the first uh, agreements that we've seen between Apple and an Android manufacturer. Uh, and the fact that it's it's for so long, uh, it also means that uh, HTC will be able to use some of Apple's uh, pr- uh, uh, patented things in its 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 devices. Those things that Samsung's not allowed to use, like slide to unlock. And uh, bounce scrolling. I'm not sure if bounce scrolling was covered, but I know slide to unlock was definitely uh, uh, licensed to HTC. So, so that makes for a very interesting uh, f- competitive future between HTC and the other Android manufacturers. Yeah, um, I, th- I think I spotted a report today uh, from Samsung. Well, one of the Samsung higher ups saying that Samsung doesn't intend to follow in HTC's footsteps and. Agree, a licensing deal with Apple. Yeah, so apparently which is... that was based on um, a relatively aggressive translation. Um, yeah, and so happen. it's yeah, that's that's what I had or we had determined, I think. But but even if whether legit or not, it's like the most unsurprising thing ever. Well, yeah, I mean they they fought in court because they wouldn't license. I mean, yeah. Right. I mean it's like oh it's like Samsung was just waiting for HTC to set the market and I was like, Yeah, okay, we'll go we'll go ahead and do a deal. You know That's that billion guys. that billion dollar uh lawsuit, uh whatever. Yeah, that was just biding our time. We're just waiting for you guys to do it and now now we'll do a deal. I mean obviously they won't. But I think I think I think this is really significant because it does actually set the tone for the others. Uh, again, Samsung is growing into Android's exception, and it's because of its size and because of its vertical integration, all of those things. Samsung is kind of a unique uh, company, um, but you know, LG isn't in Samsung's position, for example. Sony certainly isn't in Samsung's yeah. position, and those companies are the ones that stand to be next in Apple's firing line. I don't think that Apple is suing them yet, but you know, I'm sure even Apple has a limited number of lawyers. Uh, so now that they're freed up from HTC, who's to say they won't be, uh, you know, nudging and poking those companies? And that's what Microsoft did for a long time. Microsoft was suing guys like HTC and Motorola and demanding, uh, you know, royalty payments for certain Microsoft patents. And now Microsoft has a full freaking portfolio. Pretty much every Android manufacturer is paying some royalty fees. And you know, the thing that people have been saying is, uh, you know, Android is free from, <laughs> as far as Google is concerned. You get the source code from Google, but then you actually end up having to pay a whole bunch of licensing fees to Microsoft uh, and now wow. to Apple. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just but I mean, crazy. I'm just. This is how it should work, right? There'll be a little bit of fighting in the courts, and then you just say, you know what? How about we spend our time not arguing about this? And I mean, HTC in particular, like they actually had some of their devices held up, like they couldn't sell. Um, what was it? It was uh, the Evo, Evo 4G LTE. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's in there. Just get this behind them. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy. Now, what will be really interesting, uh, Vlad, you mentioned LG. Um, I think that if we see license deals that cover Nexus devices, like the Galaxy Nexus or the Nexus 4, 
that would be very interesting because that would sort of be, um, you know, stock Android is not cool with uh, with Apple's patents. Uh, yeah, it, it implicates Android itself, yes. Yeah. Rather than the skins. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it, just because, for example, well, okay, if LG decides, okay, we'll pay a licensing fee and that will cover the Nexus 4, for example, that, that just means LG thinks it, it's in danger of losing a court case, let's say, uh, no, where it needs to prove those things. But that doesn't necessarily prove that uh, Android itself infringes. Does right. Now, does Apple have a suit against LG right now? I don't think it does. I don't think it does either. I, I think Motorola is the only one that's left that Apple has an active suit against, and that's well, very and interesting. Well, well, yeah. I, I think the question might be, does Apple even know if it has... <laughs> it has <laughs> like, like, if, if you... Okay, assuming Apple's uh, press relations people actually spoke to anybody and responded to email, uh, and you reached out to them, do you think they would actually know off the top of their head who they're suing and who they're not suing? Or if you said, hey guys, do you have a lawsuit against Sony? They'd be like, yeah, let me just get, back, get to legal and find out. And then, maybe and maybe they have a, a post-it on, on their IMAX of uh, who is currently <laughs> in legal uh, litigation with them right now. Yeah, it's like, dude, we need to take care of Acer, Asus, first of all. We, we're going to have a better quarter here before we get to OG and all of those guys. I mean, it's kind of... So, I, I really do think this is kind of like uh, the dark and unpleasant side of our business because the whole patent stuff is just so tiresome. And I, I say this as somebody who studied law for a long time. I know there are actually fascinating areas of law. Uh, you might not believe it, but it's true. And patent law isn't one of them. Like, intellectual <laughs> property should be. When I first went into law and started studying it, I was like, oh, dude, IP law must be the greatest. You know, it's you, you get to talk about technology, telecoms, media, uh, all of these glamorous and interesting things. You're on the cutting edge, yada, yada, yada. And then look, look at the things we're stuck talking about. It's like, Apple got a patent on the, on the rounded rectangle. <laughs> it happened. It literally happened, and I'm reading a headline, and I'm like, you know, rubbing my eyes and not believing it. And I'm like, wait, Neil, I wrote this, so it's not a joke. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. I mean, I've, I've got nothing else to contribute to that. Yeah, so there you go. Well, so, so as far as you know, the, the the lawsuits that are left, there is definitely the lawsuit with Motorola, yeah. uh, which is Im immensely interesting because of Motorola's very close ties to Google itself now. Uh, but we still don't really know what's going to happen with that. Um, and I'm not sure what that was, Dieter, but uh, I'm just going to... Uh, I'm, I'm channeling Josh Topolsky here. I've got some problem with my hair, and so I'm just checking to make sure that it doesn't look completely ridiculous, only partially ridiculous. I would check as well, but my video feed looks completely gelatinated at the moment. Yeah, uh, Vlad, I can tell that you have hair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Which is so... a change. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, you've been yes. uh, growing that out. It looks very nice. I've made uh, but... a complete recovery from my haircut. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't really know what's going to happen yet with Motorola and Apple, uh, but I think that'll be, uh, you know, as, as as you know, Vlad just said how uninteresting all of this is. I think, if anything, it'll be interesting to see to watch to see what happens with those two. Yeah. No, no, that's, that's that's true. Like the the drama and the soap opera that. Uh, we also like to create around these things. It's going to sustain the story anyway. But speaking of soap operas, let us actually talk about Steven Sadowski uh, and his departure because so, Nita says that is still a major, major thing that happened over the weekend. Yeah, so he's out. Uh, he um, left on the 12th pretty much effective immediately, although he's you know going to hang around yes. and help if needed. Um, uh, he yeah, is, he's pulling uh, a four, four stall, yeah. Yeah, he's pulling. Well, um, that's actually exactly right. Uh, people inside the company tell us that uh, one of the big reasons that he's leaving is he just doesn't play well with others, and you know he likes you know his silo control of things and doesn't like to collaborate. And uh, you know that's what Microsoft needs to do now. They need Windows Phone eight and Windows eight and SkyDrive and Windows Live or whatever they're calling it these days, and Xbox and. I don't even know what else, you know, they all need those things to talk to each other and interoperate and, and, you know, share stuff more so than they do now. And 
Um, you know, if he's not the person to help make that happen, then, you know, I guess he's got to go. Uh, Julie Larson Green is taking over for Windows. And what's really interesting uh, for us on the mobile side is Andy Lees, who had sort of unceremoniously been taken off of the Windows Phone team to work on, like, a generic, uh, you know, cross-Windows Phone 8 Windows project that was never very well defined, is now back, and he uh, his new job is, what now? I think Windows uh, Corporate Development and Strategy. So he's sort of back in the mix as a, a player at, at Microsoft, which is, I think... I just want to say corporate development and strategy is perfectly defined, and everybody <laughs> from my grandmother to my niece, my five-year-old niece, perfectly understands and grasps the width and breadth of that position. That's just... Ah, Jesus. Um, also, what, <laughs> titles like... Vlad, you have totally eaten your Wheaties this morning. You're just an angry, angry man. <laughs> No, dude, if I eat Wheaties, I will be jogging all day. I, I'm afraid of carbs. Uh, <laughs> well, if you, have, if you have a hankering for, like, cereal, like, you know, working fiber chunks or Wheaties or whatever, like, do you ever crave carbs? Is there, like, a non-carb? No, no, but that's the point. Like, like, carbs like vegetarians make you crave eating, carbs. Vegetarians eating soy and pretending it's a burger, do you do anything like that? You pretend that something is wheat? No, I, I, I never uh, pretend. I, I keep right. it real. <laughs> he keeps it real, he keeps it raw. Yeah. <laughs> Why are we talking about Vlad's diet again? This isn't the, this not what I Because got. I just... Vlad tweeted this afternoon a picture of cauliflower and broccoli and said, this tastes as yummy as glazed donuts to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is. It really is. Um, no, I mean, if, you're, if your palate adjusts to not be completely destroyed by eating you know, sugar and donuts or whatever, then yeah, you, you taste flavors that other people don't taste and Regular so I want I want to go back to sugar. Wait, wait, no, I I was going to talk about Andy Lee. Yeah, yeah, and then we I, I just all I wanted to say was I was really happy that that Vlad is you know passionate and angry about things today, <laughs> and then we started talking about cauliflower. Yeah. I mean. Okay, well, yeah, that's a good point. And and job titles like senior vice president, and then another noun after that, like senior vice president something something operations, like that is so grammatically busted. And horrible. <laughs> I, like it makes me feel dirty if I ever have to write it in full. Uh, but s set all that aside. Um, first, first thing to say is that Steven Sinovsky was the guy in charge of Windows Eight. Yeah, right. And he and, got it um, done. Yeah, I mean, Win Windows Eight is a product of Steven Sinovsky's work. So let, let's give the guy credit. Uh, he might be a complete and epic asshole to the people he worked with. But the final product of what he produced uh, had a cohesive vision. Again, we don't we don't really know. Um, I mean, how can you really assess something as uh, you know holistic as a desktop OS over you know a few a few days uh, or a couple of weeks even? You you need to sit down and spend time with it. So so we'll see how Windows 8 develops over the long run. Um, but to me, I, I totally agree on the point about Microsoft needing to unite the, the various strands of its ecosystem, and Sinovsky's strong personality and strong need to control things uh, getting in the way of that. Because, as I say, he was the man in charge of Windows 8, and Windows 8 was like his baby, and it was like a ball, right? And he's clutching it tightly. Whereas what Microsoft is trying to do is like take these balls, uh, let's, let's, start, uh, let's get back to the food uh, metaphors, they're like three balls of mints, and you're trying to splice them and make one giant epic ball of awesomeness, right? And if he's clutching it too tightly and he can't work with the other guys, um, you know, guys like uh, Joe Belfi are in charge of Windows Phone and whoever's in charge of Xbox Live uh, and those services, that's where the friction comes in. And the first things uh, that Steve Ballmer actually remarked about his successor are, to me, the most destructive uh, yeah. pieces of information. Because he said, uh, looking at the technical and uh, the professional requirements for the job, I think she has exactly the qualities that we need. And the first quality that he identified was good communication skills. And the second was collaborate effectively. So just the things that he's highlighting as positives in her, like somebody who's just broken up with one girlfriend and moving on to a new one and saying that the new one has these really great qualities, <laughs> that usually tends to be the things that your girlfriend 
which in this case is Steven Sadowski, <laughs> <laughs> was lacking. That's enough analogies for me. <laughs> I mean, the the thing is, like the what I would expect to be next for for Windows Phone, like what you know, how would this affect Windows Phone? Like they did it right. They 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 got it on the Windows Eight Core, and uh, they, they, there's not you can't directly take a Windows Eight app and just throw it onto Windows Phone Eight. Um, so maybe they'll fix that and move in that direction, but it's actually relatively close based on what they were talking about at Build and what I've seen. Um, even if you can't just directly just like release it on both platforms at the same time, um, well, look at that light in the background there. Um, even if you can't uh, release an app on the same, both platforms just the same thing, uh, the skills that you need to make one app now directly translate to the skills to make the other app and you can share assets and it's actually very easy to do one or the other. So um, I'm not sure what this uh, executive shakeup means uh, like directly for the future of Windows Phone that they haven't already accomplished under, you know, under Sanofsky's leadership. I, I just want to say that Andy Lees was the guy who's the head of Kin. Yeah. Oh, I mean, dude, come on. Don't hold that against him. <laughs> As somebody who has a massive, enormous... Didn't Lees, didn't Lees come late yeah. to Kin, though? Didn't he kind of inherit Kin? I can't remember the timeline. Uh, I, I just want to point out, I Dan, look at has, all of Dan has an enormous printer in the background uh, on his video feed. Enormous. And apparently he uses it every day, which makes him a completely evil person. <laughs> I wouldn't so, say every day, but it gets used every week. Right. Uh, so what I'm saying, Dan, is you can't hold bad decisions against people. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't hold that against you too much. So you can't hold that against Andalese. Like, okay, K Kin failed. So you move on. It doesn't mean that the guy himself is a complete and utter failure. Well, and, and like you were saying with his uh, extremely nebulous uh, title, we don't really even know how close he'll be to uh, Windows Phone 8 anyways. So. Yeah. But yeah, it will be very interesting to see, uh, you know, uh, how Windows Phone 8, like you were saying, Dieter, how it'll develop uh, parallel with Windows Phone or Windows 8 uh, and, and if it'll become even closer than they are now. Uh, the one thing that with Sanofsky is, uh, I guess a lot of people really thought him to be uh, Steve Ballmer's successor as CEO. Uh, oh, yeah. But um, that's not the case. So uh, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. It'll be interesting to see uh, who in Microsoft, uh, you know, kind of bubbles to the top as as maybe possibly the the uh, successor to Ballmer. Yeah. Or maybe Ballmer will just continue to be for eternity. Uh and I mean, we should, it's funny, we haven't pointed out, like, Windows Phone 8 has launched. Like, we should bring that up. Like, the 920, the 8X are on AT&T, uh, what's Verizon got the 10 I forget uh, what's on every carrier. Uh, so the, 820, the 822 and the 8X, those are going to be in stores on the 15th. Verizon yeah. clarified that today. Uh, and then also on T-Mobile, the uh, 810. 810. 810. Yeah. And... Um, uh, the, Sprint's that, gonna have phones next that's year. That's available today, actually. From TV Verizon's right. gonna have a free Windows Phone 8 device by the end of the year, which is fine. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess you know, the Verizon has that the, the hundred dollar price point and the two hundred dollar price point. So the free yeah. price point is kind of like that low end cover. So, so Verizon's definitely got a full Windows Phone 8 spread, uh, you know, covering all of the price points um, that it would expect to cover. Uh, to match against uh, its Android offerings and, of course, against the iPhone models that it offers. So how excited are we about all of this? Um, uh, Chris was very excited. He went out to an AT&T store and bought a Lumia 920. A Cyan one. A, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, I will answer that question, Vlad, as we get closer to the holiday season and we start to see how the marketing push goes and how sales go. Uh, as a result of that marketing push. Ah, oh, so um, you, you, you're going to be like a sports commentator. <laughs> uh, I, I well, no, that. no, 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 but no, listen, it, it you know, we well, uh, dude, consistently... Dude, you, you're, you're, just, like, you're just saying no when you don't even know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> what you, okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, let, let, let me get my analogy out. Like, I was, I was watching uh, the NFL over the weekend, and the thing that I was consistently noticing is that the Vikings are well, awesome and totally pants the Lions. That's what I noticed over the... Yeah, dude, Adrian Peterson, man. Amazing. Oh, God. Um, 
But the thing I was I was also noticing is that sports commentators love to wait until a decision a decision's consequences are fully apparent, and then <laughs> they give their expert opinion on it. So they wait until uh, like a. Now, see, this referee. is what I thought you were going to say, and let me tell yeah. you why you're wrong. Go ahead. Because our consistent complaint about Windows Phone 8 is that the app ecosystem isn't there either in terms of, of breadth, but especially in terms of depth and like apps feeling uh, on par with what's available on the other platforms. And uh, Microsoft is doing what, everything they can to solve that problem. But the thing that will actually solve that problem are sales numbers, are devices in people's hands and people demanding from these app developers to make better and more apps for Windows Phone 8. And the only way those sales numbers are going to go up is if we see uh, you know, real and genuine marketing push. So we've got a chicken and egg problem here, but the, you know, it's, it's a classic ecosystem conundrum. But one of the ways that we have seen that ecosystem conundrum get solved is Verizon or, uh, you know, AT&T or carriers and the manufacturers, or in this case, Microsoft, working together on a unified, awesome, powerful, and huge holiday marketing push to actually sell devices. And if that happens, then you know, by the end of the holiday season, we will see more devices, more market share, and that will drive more apps. So, uh, you know, I'm, you know, am I excited? I'll be excited if, um, you know, it's able to, you know, lead to a more robust ecosystem. And I think it could. Uh, I think they're doing everything they can. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see what the marketing looks like. And I had another point, and I lost it, but. Uh, that's because Bro, let, let me just say your first point again. was so damn good that I have no <laughs> comeback. <laughs> so uh, to, to follow yeah. up with Dieter's point, uh, yesterday I, at the Droid DNA launch event, I had a little bit of time to chat with Verizon's uh, CMO, uh, and I asked her, um, you know, Verizon's marketing push in the holidays is always very large, and it can be the type of thing that either makes a device succeed or makes a device fail. Uh, and I asked, you know, uh, what's it going to be like for Windows Phone 8? And uh, the, Verizon hasn't really started its marketing campaign yet, um, mm -hmm. but she did say that uh, starting at, when they're available in stores, so I guess tomorrow they're going to be available in stores, so we should be seeing some, some Windows Phone 8 ads from Verizon. Uh, and, and we'll have to see if it's as big of a campaign as obviously the Droid has been and obviously what Verizon's done with uh, Apple ads. I mean, Microsoft is promising a big campaign too. Um, you know, but like Rolling Thunder, uh, that, you know, was not much. Um, <laughs> well, that was Nokia, right? Yeah, I know. But what I'm saying is like big promises don't necessarily yield big results. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, here's the thing. Like, this is a new platform again. And I know that apps from Windows Phone 7 and 7.5 carry over. And I know it's been around for a couple of years. Um, but in terms of what apps are actually able to do with native code now uh, and like, games able to get ported to it or even launching on it originally uh, much more quickly. Um, it's, it's a whole new platform that has new possibilities that haven't been exploited on Windows Phone at all because they just weren't there. And yeah. I want to see, you know, I want to see apps that could, I want an IRC app that can persist in the background. I want, you know, killer games that appear on Windows Phone the same day they appear on iOS or Windows, even. I just, I just uh, want a Starbucks app a <laughs> so I can yeah. buy coffee <laughs> without yeah. having to trust the third-party sketchy app. So, I mean, it they've built everything they need to do. Now they just need to sell the phones and get the virtuous cycle and the ecosystem going. I can't believe just the sheer dependency that Dan has built up <laughs> on his smartphone. Like, <laughs> this thing doesn't have a Starbucks app. I, I can't get coffee anymore. You I, don't understand, Vlad. I don't know how to exist anymore. Can somebody if, help me? If I, don't, if I don't use my Starbucks app, I don't earn my rewards points, and then I don't oh, get yeah. my free drink. So it's, it's, all, it's a cycle they've got me sucked in. Dude, you know I'm, it's not I'm a totally free drink. sucked in. What's that? You know, you know it's not a free drink. Well, like, if you, if you let, me, have let me have my dream, okay? If you actually came to negotiate with people like Starbucks or people like your supermarket uh, and they asked you, uh, how much do you want uh, for your data? How much do you want for your shopping habits? And you were going to sell them. You could get so much more <laughs> than freaking, you know, a few cents on every purchase. So then eventually it adds up to a free drink in quotation marks. You're being ripped off with all these loyalty cards. I mean, think about it. It's a loyalty card. You're the loyal one. That's like 
it's a, it's a convenience factor, and it's you know the the, the I, stupid uh, rewards are whatever. But now the truth is that Dan uh, will only get coffee from Starbucks. He hates uh, local businesses. He hates <laughs> entrepreneurs. He hates you know the local coffee shop. You know some mom and pop place. He wants corporations to win. Uh, you know. Vlad, you and I are, are, you know, socialists, but he is a hardcore <laughs> capitalist. Uh, he's he's one percent. That's you know, on the one percent, uh, yes. have an app, a Starbucks app on their phone. I mean, they just deserve it, right? right. I mean, it, it's sitting on his on his iPhone right next to his Fogger app. You know, just right there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I maybe, don't even need to open Dan the app. Just the, the passbook opens it for me. Think about that. <laughs> I walk into the Starbucks and passbook opens my 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 app for me. And, and it's like, go spend this money on sugary loaded, uh, over roasted coffee that doesn't really taste that good. And, and <laughs> like, how are you not horrified by the stuff you're just saying right now? It's like, <laughs> oh hey, it's the apocalypse, it's coming. Let's <laughs> stop laughing it. But maybe that's a realistic point. I mean, the other thing we found out uh, this week is that apparently. Arabica coffee is going to go extinct because of global warming within the next 80 years. This is a crisis. This is a for real crisis. Yeah, like, I mean, Arabica isn't the only type of coffee, but it's the higher quality. It's the one that matters. Nobody wants to drink <laughs> Robusta. Come on. Oh, dude, I can't believe how much reaction we wrote about this. And first of all, I'm like, wait, we write about coffee now? This is within our remit? And then I, I look at it, and, I and it's been... like... Very mad if we did not cover this story. <laughs> and, and then I saw the, like people have picked it up on Facebook and on Twitter, and there's like hundreds and hundreds of comments, and everybody's alarmed about it and all of these things. Whereas if we do an article about uh, you know landfill in Southeast Asia, it will get like six comments, and you know five other people will be like, "Well, that sucks." Uh, where's the Troy DNA coming out again? <laughs> Uh, you know, coffee. We we need to preserve that. <laughs> Before we wrap up, uh, I do want. Oh, do we want? Do we want to talk about FaceTime on AT and T? Um, I yeah, just want to point out that, that 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 Sweetbrit in the chat was that was that who it was? Yeah, Sweetbrit in the chat just wanted to say that uh, Dan so Republican. He installed the <laughs> latest Romney on his phone. <laughs> Boom. That makes that makes me happy. I love I love I love a bad pun, man. <laughs> Um, so AT and T has like backtracked just the tiniest, tiniest amount. And I wish we had Chris here to uh, to rant about this because he wrote a really good article about how AT and T's flip flop on FaceTime over cellular should scare you. Like they're allowing device uh, iPhones not mm -hmm. on mobile share to do FaceTime over cellular, but it's still twitchy, right? Like it's not every single plan. They just stepped it back just a little bit. And um, it's, you know, in response to not direct regulatory pressure, but like the threat of a possibility of it. Um, but it's still like, it, it shows that like us complaining about FaceTime on the mobile podcast doesn't actually fix anything. <laughs> Uh, it's it's insane how arbitrary these restrictions are yeah. uh, because uh, it, before it was you had to be on a mobile share plan. Didn't matter which device you owned. Uh, if it was FaceTime compatible and was on a mobile share plan, you could use it over cellular. And now it's like, well, only if you have an LTE device, but you don't have to be on LTE to use it. You could still mm -hmm. be on an HSPA plus network right. uh, or a connection and use it, but it's got to be an LTE device. So it's like, sorry for us users who are not on mobile share. And sorry for iPhone users who are on grandfathered unlimited plans because if you're on an unlimited plan, you're you're just well. I'm assuming that it's allowed. that that arbitrary restriction is because they're still afraid uh, that their network is going to fall down because there's just flat out more iPhone 4s users out there than there are iPhone 5 users. Probably. So it's not about LTE. It's about it's about just limiting the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Although I must admit. Um, as well as Dan explained everything, I am completely at a loss of what the hell is going on over there. <laughs> I have no idea. No idea. Uh, well, I would just, just like to note that, you know, how many carriers are uh, carry offer the iPhone across the world? And there's one carrier that has a problem with it, and it's AT&T. And, like, yeah. no other carrier is having a problem with FaceTime. So. Go America! Yeah. 
Okay, no, nobody enjoyed that. <laughs> okay, but actually, um, I just wanted uh, to squeeze in a couple of observations from the UK before Dieter wraps us up in his expert style. Uh, first of all, on the topic of Passbook, which Dan brought up with the Starbucks application, uh, and that, that's cool that it happens for you automatically, Dan. I'm, I'm really happy for you, uh, and I'm going to let you finish buying that coffee. Uh, but actually, Passbook in the UK is one of the saddest things you will ever see. There is like four compatible things, and I use well, zero I, I, I want to say that it's pretty, it's pretty damn sad in the US, too, because I use it for Starbucks. And I, I, when we reviewed iOS 6 at the time, the only thing that was available for Passbook was a Walgreens app. And so I have that installed as well. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty pathetic. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's barren at the moment, uh, which is atypical of Apple, but then so is Maps. So whatever. <laughs> Um, hey man, hey, Nokia dude. Maps coming to iOS. Yes, we that's about that. Yeah, we did not add that to our list, did we? Uh, so no, it's, they, they rebranded here. They bought here.com. They're doing crowdsourcing for their Maps uh, data, which seems like amazing. But Google's been doing that forever, and Waze is doing that. And there's you know Open Street Maps, and there's, that, that's you know everybody's doing that. Um, but yeah, no, then it's coming to iOS uh, is potentially really great because Nokia's mapping is you know really good. Uh, I just hope they get it released in relatively short order. Um, so actually, yeah. we've been doing this series, this mind-blowing series of uh, living with things, which which is right now focused around uh, home theater stuff, so like Xbox 360, the PS3, Amazon devices, etc. And I'm thinking we need to do one with living with Nokia Maps. Because I actually, you know, I've, I've tried it. I've always tried it occasionally. I've given it a shot during reviews and whatever. But I've never sat down and actually, like, used it extensively the way that I've used Google Maps uh -huh. and had to rely on it on a daily basis. And I'm sure the same would be fascinating to do with respect to iOS 6. Um, not that this is, like, a pitch meeting for future features. <laughs> but I do, I, do, I do feel like sometimes we, we kind of, um, you know, you, you kind of need to spend some extensive time to really appreciate these things because all I ever hear about Nokia Maps is yes, it's good and it's been reliable enough when I've used it on occasion, but I'm still kind of wary. Like, I wouldn't buy a phone and think this is as good as Google Maps. Yeah. Would you guys say that's the case? I, I think we're so, we're in, so in, my, in my testing, Maps. yeah, in my testing in, in terms of accuracy and, you know, directions and everything else, Nokia Maps has been as good as Google Maps. I've had, I've had no problems there. Uh, I've had some unfamiliarity with the UI, uh, and I kind of don't love it. Um, and there's a problem specifically on the Lumi 920 where, like, the old Bing Maps was still there in a weird way. Anyway, uh, so it, I think if you were to live with... Uh, Nokia Maps for a month. I think you would probably find that you would get used to the UI. You'd feel pretty good about it, um, and you may get really into stuff like you know the the local uh, local Scouts of Windows Phone eight thing. But I forget what Nokia's local like. They've got their augmented reality app. City lens. Some of their local city lens. Yeah. <laughs> um, Which people in the country really find appreciate. It, yeah, I doubt you would find it as like. As good as I don't know, say Yelp in, in certain areas. Um, no, Yelp is garbage. Well, Yelp can't even is, find carrots. Yelp is garbage <laughs> everywhere except for uh, San Francisco. Yeah, Yelp is I, amazing in San Francisco. Uh, Yelp can't it. find carrots. So nh I'm not even gonna try looking for watermelon. Forget Yelp, man. Oh, well, isn't watermelon Yelp too sweet? Yelp done. And watermelon must have way too much sugar, man. No, no, it doesn't. That's the, that's the thing. It's really, really sweet, but it's actually very low in calories and sugar. It's mm. it's amazing. Watermelon is utterly amazing. What do you do with it's the so seeds? Nutritious. Eat them. Yeah. All right. Aren't you aren't you afraid of a watermelon growing? Man in your up, belly? man. Eat the seeds. <laughs> so I just Deal want to say that it, it's it's going to be a very uh, amusing day when I download and install a Nokia Maps app on my iPhone. I just yeah. find that very. Uh, just to clarify, is it? Is it now just called here, or is it Nokia here? I don't recall. Um, I think it's I think it's just here. I mean, you know, it's from Nokia, so it's Nokia here. Chris put it uh, yesterday. I was I was saying that, and he's like, "Well, just think of it as the Nad Tech app." So. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, I've used a whole bunch of different uh, third-party map solutions on iOS, and they're all pretty terrible. Yeah. Um, so far. Right. 
And so if they can, you know, make this feel, I think it's just called here maps. Oh, it don't tell me it's called here maps. Like, why have the here at all if you just still call it, call it maps? I mean, are you really that worried about what is? Uh, yes, damn it! I've, I've said I'm going to <laughs> rant about everything today, so I'm worried. Okay. But but yeah, uh, the other thing I was just going to throw in quickly is something um, uh, I could have commented on a couple of weeks back, and uh, I was missing from last week's podcast, which was LTE in London, uh, here in the UK. Yeah. Uh, because I managed to get an LTE. You know, do a little round. Uh, around the city journey and test it out and see how it what, works. What LTE handset did you get? You, you broke up there for a second. Uh, from EE. It's, it was a Galaxy S3, but you know, they, oh, okay. have, uh, they support the iPhone 5, uh, the Lumia 920, etc. Um, and they have the HTC One XL. Honestly, the One X, One XL, One X Plus, Xperia T, Xperia TL, Nokia 820, Lumia 822. These, these guys are like... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I have no words left to describe them. But anyway, seriously. Uh, LTE in London is good, bordering on glorious, depending on where you are. Yeah. And completely irrelevant, again, depending on where you are. Yeah. So if you are where I live, in a perfectly civilized, lovely, leafy area of North London, there's just nothing. I mean, the best I can get is 3G plus, whatever yeah. the heck that is, uh, to actually do a bit of commuting, move around. Uh, but, okay, so I'm in Mosul Hill, but as soon as I start approaching Highgate, I get reception, and then it jumps from, like, 3 and 4 megabit, which is actually kind of low uh, compared to the 3 network. Um, I jump from that from three to four megabit to like nineteen down and seventeen up, and like speed test starts flying. I mean, just literally flying. And I'm like, that's wow. that's when it starts becoming fun to just run the speed tests. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not kidding. It's like usually I run a speed test and I, I go and do and think about something else. It's it's like <laughs> making tea. That's how it is. Whereas with, with this thing, it's like you tap on speed test and you, you look outside and you look down and it's already done, right? And as you move into, uh, you know, particularly areas of good coverage in the city, the highest speeds I got were like 36, uh, 38 megabits down and something like 20 up, which are just crazy on a phone. And I'm really starting to appreciate why you guys are so nuts about LTE. And I can tell yeah. you, I can tell you, I can tell you that, uh, you know, Two weeks ago, I was saying, people here in the UK, we're going to be okay with the fact that it doesn't have LTE, and the vast majority of people here are going to be perfectly fine with it because EE's price plans are not great, its coverage is not great, uh, its bandwidth, or, or rather the frequency at which it operates, isn't great for penetration into buildings, so you won't be covered everywhere you go outside, and some buildings you go inside the office and you lose your super fast connectivity. So there's a whole heap of things standing in the way. But when you do get that little boost of LTE, man, it's like it's like primordial man tasting his first refined sugar. It's nuts. He's just a rush. <laughs> which, which Vlad will not eat. <laughs> I won't eat. That's right. But, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's good. There are just uh, a whole bunch of caveats at the moment. Wait, I, I hope, it'll be interesting to see how... Um... The uh, the network in in the UK will handle load as more people uh, get on it because those speeds that you're saying uh, we see them from time to time in the US but most of the time if you're on Verizon's LTE network which is which is you know pretty broad and, and fairly well loaded at this point uh, you don't usually see 20 up and 20 down um, no. but you see more like 13 down and, and seven or eight or nine up which is still which, by the really way good, come on but, yeah, yeah I mean compare that to which what is, you yeah. experience in Evdo or HSPA it's like Oh yeah, when it when it hands off down to three G, I just pretty much want to just put my phone away and give up yeah. because uh, Verizon CDMA service is so slow. And and there's just uh, one other addendum I wanted to throw in, uh, and I was here, I was listening to this on the BBC, which is actually that apparently development in Africa uh, with mobile telephones. First of all, sales of phones in Africa are like 
going off the chain. Uh, I mean, I'm sure they're like 2G, really basic, simple phones, but everybody needs a phone nowadays because um, of mobile payments and things like that. They facilitate uh, things which aren't possible and connectivity and all of these things, um, which isn't that fascinating. But the thing that I picked up uh, from this BBC report was actually that quite a few carriers in Africa might completely skip 3G and just start right. building out 4G. Um, and this is uh, something I found cute about Bulgaria's uh, broadband rollout because we never bothered with uh, dial-up and DSL and all these things. It just jump straight to like fiber optic connections and big fat pipes and all of these things, which is why I have 50 megabit at home in the most rural part of Bulgaria. And 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 this is I don't know I, I just really enjoy the idea of people in Africa going from like 2G. Where everything's so, like text based. Like I'll send you a payment text. I'll send you a Facebook message text. And all of a sudden, like four G droid DNA is dropping out of the fucking sky. I'm sorry for swearing. Um, uh, twice. <laughs> three three times if you count the uh, the a hole. That's not swearing. That that's an anatomic uh, analogy. Yeah. On that on that beautiful note, I am gonna wrap up the Verge Mobile show for this week. If you want to follow us on Twitter, where we do occasionally swear, you can. Uh, I'm at Backlon, Vlad's at Vlad Savov. Dan's at DC Seifert. Yes, Seifert is spelled with an E-I. Chris, who is not here, is at Z Power. And if you want to tell him that you missed him on the show, you can. But I recommend you do so with a photo of a cyan-colored phone. Uh, we'll be back next week. Which day? Who knows? We'll see how we feel. We're not beholden to anybody. I mean... We're bold to you, our viewers, but whatever. Okay, goodbye. Thanks for watching. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys.